Hello, here we are for part six of lecture 21 of CENG 4412 Steel and Concrete Design. Okay, in this portion of the video, or in this portion of the lecture, I want to move on to covering the shear strength of high strength bolts. I show shear strength of high strength bolts. All right, let's see, we're good, and we are. Okay. Shear strength of high strength bolts. The shear strength of high strength bolts. Okay, so uh, let's discuss some ASTM designations. Oh, I seem to have zoomed in. There we go. Uh, ASTM designations. Uh, we have a few. A307. Oops, still on blue, on black. Uh, let's do A3. Let's discuss A307. Uh, A325 and A490. and A490. Uh, these are common or sometimes referred to as unfinished bolts or unfinished bolts, rarely used uh, anymore in structural applications. Uh, so we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about them. Rarely used anymore. Instead, we're going to be focusing our efforts on A325 and A490. And when I say A325 and A490, really, these are, at least for our purposes here, there's some distinctions, but uh, I'm simplifying a bit. But basically, for our purposes, they are just different material properties. Um, so these are what we call high strength bolts, uh, very highly designed, high, uh, high quality, high strength bolts. And they do actually have quite high strength as compared to most uh, materials where we say like, uh, you know, we're dealing with uh, ultimate strengths in the, you know, 50, 80, et cetera range, something like that, um, you know, a for A36, A992, et cetera. Um, high strength bolts typically have an ultimate stress, uh, ultimate st uh, tensile stress, an ultimate tensile stress equal to 100 to 150 KSI. So quite high actually. Um, so here, so again, we're going to focus more on A325 and A490. Now, uh, installation, I, wanna, I do want to give some notes on installation, how you actually install these things. Uh, bolts do need to be installed to provide proper uh, clamping or pretension force. Uh, need uh, to be installed. to provide a proper clamping or pretension force. Here. Now, there are some types of connections where this where this pretension force is actually critical. So for example, you'll have some connections where you have one plate joining to another, and imagine I were to come along and put a bolt here, and I were to come, I would put an enormous tensile stress in this thing. Basically, I'm forcing this thing together via, uh, when, you put, when you apply a, when you turn the nut on a bolt and really uh, torque it on there, really tight with a, with a wrench, you are basically stretching the bolt and in turn clamping down the plates together. Now, if you think about this, if you have two steel surfaces that are clamping together, uh, that effectively is a providing a vastly increased normal force between the two surfaces. And that in turn provides a massive frictional force between those two planes. So you do have some uh, connections and we refer to those as slip critical connections where the actual tension in the bolt is important. Now, we're not going to get uh, into that. That's a bit beyond the scope of this course, but I do want you to be aware of that. So uh, what those are. So uh, slip critical connections 
if I say a slip critical connection, what that means, or if you see that in the code, what that means is that the, uh, the bolts are tightened uh, sufficiently, uh, must be tightened sufficiently to provide frictional force between the plates, to provide a certain frictional force between the plates. You're actually relying on the friction between the plates to provide your shear capacity to hold your, pl your plates together. Uh, must be tightened uh, to provide sufficient she uh, shear capacity. Uh, sufficient uh, connection capacity, or I should say, sufficient uh, sufficient uh, frictional force, and that frictional force is what's going to largely hold your connection together. But that is a bit more difficult to design for. What we're going to be working on instead is the simplest case of of uh, a bolt shear, and that is snug tight connections, what we refer to as snug tight connections. Uh, conditions. Basically what snug tight means is this is where uh, you effectively just take it up to the point um, where a, this is sort of the, well, how to define snug tight. Well, uh, snug tight is effectively the full effort of an average worker, an average iron worker uh, using an ordinary spud wrench. Uh, full effort of an average iron worker, so maybe a bit stronger, maybe a bit tighter than I could manage, but uh, without using a ridiculously long wrench anyway, but I can I can know mechanical advantage, so I know how to do that. But uh, anyway, so maybe the iron worker can probably get that to a higher tension than I can, but that's okay. Um, so uh, snug tight conditions are uh, effectively is defined as the full ec uh, uh, effort of an iron worker uh, using an ordinary spud wrench um, that bling, that brings the uh, using uh, an ordinary spud wrench uh, that brings the plate the connected plates into firm contact. The connected plates into firm contact. Or you can also define this as, and the code goes into some detail on this, but it also uh, basically, you can also achieve this through just a few impacts of an impact wrench. And where are these allowed? So in the, sub, in the snug tight connection, you're basically just saying everything is decently locked together. Things aren't wobbling around anymore. And so uh, things aren't really free to move. You're not relying on that connection to provide vast frictional force. Rather, everything's just pretty much locked together. Like imagine if, you know, what you could put together with a hand wrench or something like that. But iron worker wrench is a bit larger than your, uh, you know, the wrench you used to put, to put an Ikea something together. But uh, still, um, t the types of tensions you can get with ordinary hand tools. A sl snug tight connection uh, or snug tight conditions are allowed for uh, A bearing type connections and which is what we're going to be discussing. And tension or combined shear tension. Tension or combined shear tension. Tension or combined shear tension uh, where fatigue due to live load is not a concern. Or fatigue due to live load is not a concern. Okay, 
that's the basic idea of us uh, of these again we're not gonna be concerned with slip critical connection um but anyway and there are a whole bunch of ways to determine the exact level of tension in a slip critical connection but that's going to be a bit beyond the scope of our course today of our course here okay so let's look at the shear strength of high strength bolts now uh here the shear strength of high strength bolts Here, now we need to define, the code uh, handles things very differently depending on the location of a bolt, uh, the location of a shear plane along the length of the bolt. Uh, in a structural bolt, the, so basically the location of the shear plane is critical. So for example, if you have a bolt here and let's consider a bolt, consider a bolt like this. And let's say it has a, a number of threads. Well, these threads typically aren't gonna cover the entire length of the bolt. They're gonna stop at a certain point. And that's for a variety of reasons. It's mainly one of the main reasons for this is so that you can often leave the uh, the plane, the, sh the shear plane, outside of the uh, the uh, outside of the uh, of the threading. See, the thing about the threading is that if you look at a bolt edge on, you'll have the inner diameter, and then you'll have the threading around it. Well, the thing about the threading, these threads are very, 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 very fine. And because of that, we can't really rely on the diameter, the portion of the cross section that the, that, the, uh, that the threads take up. When we're calculating the shear capacity, we can only look at the solid chunk of the bolt, not the, uh, the threaded part of the bolt, the actual threads themselves. However, if we're, doing, if we're dealing with something, uh, if our plane of shear is up here, then uh, we don't have to worry about that. We actually have the full diameter. Um, so, basically, depending on where our shear plane is, so let's maybe go ahead and label this. This could be case um, here. This is maybe case one here. And maybe this is case two. One, uh, for bolts in which, uh, in which threads are excluded from the shear plane, are excluded from the shear plane. So in other words, we're saying, okay, look, the bolt has the part of the, uh, at the end of the bolt near the, near the head, there is going to be a portion of the bolt that doesn't have any threads. If, you're, if your uh, shear plane where your plates meet up is within that smooth region, then you're in case one. And because of that, you're allowed, the code allows you to have a higher stress. So for bolts in which the threads are excluded from the shear plane, A shear plane. So we'll have that. And then two, uh, where for bolts in which in which threads are not or, or are included. Are included in the shear plane. So we have these two different cases. Uh, oh, in the shear plane. And let me change colors and go back here. Are included in the shear plane. So let's go back up here to the case where they're excluded. Here, our FV, this would be our uh, design stress, is going to be 0 0.5 times the ultimate stress, FU. And again, this is not, well, actually, this is not a fee yet. This is just the um, nominal stress the nominal allowable stress. And then we have, uh, in case where it's excluded, it is, um, we have to multiply this by a 0 0.8, 0 0.80 times uh, 0 0.50, uh, 0 0.50 uh, 
FU here. Basically, we multiply this times 0.8 because what this assumes is that the area of the bolt um, threaded assumes uh, basically that the area of the bolt outside the thread, basically the, the inner part of the bolt, assumes inner part of, uh, of bolt is 80% of the overall area of the bolt. A bolt is 80% of overall bolt area. Or this can be seen as you can this can be collapsed to simply 0.4 fu here. Uh, 0.4 fu. But the nice thing about this is that you don't need to, that you don't need to actually calculate the individual area of the thread uh, of the inner thread portion because we're just going to use different allowable stresses for each of these, and in turn uh, for both uh, with both we will use area bolt equal to pi over four diameter of bolt squared times the diameter of the bolt squared. Okay. Now, let's see how this is actually handled in the code. The nice thing about this is that this is, uh, you don't actually need to do this calculation every time. Uh, this is actually all combined together in a very nice table for us. And uh, so th what I want to discuss is table uh, J3.2. Uh, nom table J3.2. And this is found on page 16.1-129 of the 15th edition. Okay, so if you so please turn there if you can if you're as you're watching, and what you will see here is you have a uh, the column on the left describes what types of bolts we're dealing with, then we have nominal tensile strength and nominal shear strength, and both of these in KSI and uh, MPA English and metric. Then um, we have this here. Uh, and notice we have group, we have different groups, uh, group A, group uh, B, and notice, look what they say, uh, group A and B are our two main ones that we've been talking about, e.g. 325, e.g. Uh, 490. Okay, so let's look at how this handles this. Well, it provide these pro are provided as stresses here, so to get the actual, um, to get the actual, uh, let's say, uh, to get the actual uh, forces, you would simply multiply by the corresponding, uh, by the area. So let's look here. And now, uh, we're not going to be looking at the, uh, we're not going to be looking at the, uh, uh, shall we say the, uh, tensile strength right now. Instead, what I want to be looking at is the, uh, shear strength. So let's look, let's click at this. A307, we're not worried about that. Uh, now, notice what we have. We have A325, Below that, we have A325 uh, first, where uh, when threads are not excluded. Uh, and then we have where they are excluded. In fact, let me go ahead and use the order that they're listed here. Uh, so uh, the second line is group A, bolts when threads are not excluded from the shear plane. Okay, when threads are not excluded, or in other words, they are included. Um, so we have A325-N here. Uh, and then a three twenty five dash x. Then we have a four ninety when threads are not excluded. It's they do exp uh, ex write this in a very interesting fashion, and there's some history behind that. A four ninety dash n. Sometimes you see them designated as this, and then is in the next line on the on the fifth line here, a four ninety dash x. And uh, what does this mean? Well, this nomenclature, X, the X designation means when threads are excluded. Uh, threads are excluded. So this is bolt type. Bolt type and RN. Where this is equal to FV uh, times AB.
but you'll still need to multiply by AB. Uh, where threads, so X is where the X condition is where threads are excluded from shear plane. And N, it says where threads are not excluded. In other words, they are included. Are included in shear plane. And there's no coincidence that these values are lower in shear plane. And so if we look at the values in this table for the shear, nominal shear strength in bearing type connections, we're looking at, we're not looking at the, the tensile capacity, we are looking at the shear strength. And so for the A325-N, the, uh, the in KSI, the FNV, actually they use FNV instead of FN, but anyway, that would be 54, uh, let me go ahead and for this first one, it would be 54 times the area of the bolt there. Then we would have 68 times the area of the bolt. Then we would have uh, 68 for the 490-N, uh, uh, where they're not excluded. In other words, they're included. This would be 68 times the area of the bolt. And uh, then 84 times the area of the bolt. And these are the allowable stresses. 84 times the area of the bolt. All right, um, there. So we have that, and those are our allowable stresses. Well, of course, uh, but then to actually find the loads, you need to multiply by the area of the bolt. Also, note, let me, know, go, ahead and let me, let me go ahead and put this in big bold letters. This is per shear plane. Per shear plane. If you have more than one uh, shear plane, you'll need to multiply this. So if you have two shear planes, uh, you would multiply this value, this Rn by two, okay? And then you, of course, also need to use a, uh, a, 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 a resistance factor. In this case, it's going to be at 0 0.75 because this is going to be a, um, this is going to be a uh, fracture failure. But let's see how this all combines together. So finally, we can get to our design shear capacity. Oh, where did I go? And there we go. Uh, we can get to our overall design shear capacity. So basically we get our allowable stresses from that previous table. And then design shear capacity, combining all this together for bolts. Uh, phi Rn is going to be phi times NSP times FV uh, AB, uh, where phi Rn is the design shear capacity, uh, phi is our resistance factor, that's going to be equal to 0 0.5, NSP and you won't necessarily find this equation written in the code. Um, this is uh, taking into account the number of planes, number of shear planes. NSP is the number of shear planes. Uh, FV, or AB anyway, I'll, I'll go ahead and use, uh, do it in order. FV is the allowable sh uh, shear stress. Well, uh, shear uh, that, that is not a, that allowable shear stress. Uh, AB is the area of the bolt. And this is equal to pi over four times DB squared. And uh, D where DB is the nominal bolt diameter.
And that's pretty much it. That includes the method and theory of calculating a nominal capacity of um, bolted connections, or at least a sh nominal shear capacity of bolted connections. Okay, so with that here, um, let's see. Um, now, let's see here. I might do a uh, a bit. I might do a bit short video after a very short video after this talk. Talk about hole types, but for now that will cover uh, the basis the basics of uh, calculating the shear strength of bolts in bearing type connections. All right, that'll do it for for now. We'll come back in a bit and uh, continue on. Um, so with this, we have now covered all of the major components of bolted connections. We have looked. Let's go back up here and see what we've looked at. Just actually, let me just go back up here. Let's look at our summary here. We have looked at uh, bearing failure. We've learned, learned how to calculate that. We've learned how to calculate bolt shear strength. We've learned about edge distance requirements, and we also know all of our uh, tension member design requirements that we learned earlier in the year. All right, that'll do it for this portion of the lecture, and as always, thank you.